Well, it is great to be here with you as we worship together today, and we do have a special opportunity for you today as we continue in our summer series, a study of the book of Romans. We are not experiencing the record highs we're seeing in the western states of America, but man, oh man, the humidity is back. Summer is here in our region. And so we've been working through this book of the Bible, and maybe that's new for you to read the Bible. Maybe that's new for you to study the Bible. And in this journey, we've been saying, hey, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, take a look, take a study, because here's what we know. If you have already read and already studied the verses we're going to be looking at on the weekend, you'll get more out of it. Now, if you come having not read, you you won't get lost, but when you do engage on the front end, you're going to find your ability to study God's Word affirmed and invigorated. As we've been doing this study, we've made it to chapter 6, so to this point, we've talked about how God has revealed Himself to humanity, but how we tend to go our own way, and in that own way, God has revealed Himself like He's written His law both in print and on our hearts. In that journey, we have discovered that we need a Savior, and God invites us to experience our Savior by faith. And the gift is spectacular. So over the last couple weeks, we've seen that what Adam did to us is far surpassed by what Jesus did for us. And in our study, we come to the topic of baptism. Now, as we're going to find out, baptism, when you see somebody get baptized, it's tip of the iceberg of everything that's happening. And in this special service, we're going to invite you to consider that you need to remember your baptism, or today might be your day to be baptized. Once in a while, it doesn't happen very often, every year or two. We give you an opportunity to be spontaneously baptized. And that invitation is going to be extended to you that today, as you hear the gospel, as you recognize what baptism is, that you would respond, not even knowing coming into today you were going to do it, but today that you would be baptized. Now, some of you are planners and you are already freaking out mentally. (laughs) So here's the deal. Behind that wall, There's a table set up, and there is a pile of towels. There are piles of t-shirts. There are even shorts and stretchy pants uh, that are there for you if you did not come prepared. But let's be honest. It could be worse than walking away from church dripping wet. could be worse. It could be worse than sitting in a restaurant thinking, did I get the booth all wet? Wouldn't that be a horrible thing to experience if God stirs in you today to respond to him by being baptized? And the reality is, the first time the gospel was preached after the resurrection of Jesus, day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got baptized that day, and not a one of them came dressed to be baptized. So what if? What if? All right, so before we jump to that, Let's have a conversation. This is kind of a conversation that you and I would have if you reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like to talk about being baptized. I have questions. I'm not sure. This is the kind of conversation that you and I would have. So let's, let's have it together. So we're ready for Romans chapter 6. We're going to begin with one of the last verses from chapter 5. So go ahead and grab your Bible, your Bible app. Romans 6. Back up a couple verses, and we come to Romans 5.20, where Scripture says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What Adam did to us was far exceeded by what Jesus did for us. And for some of us, this is the message we needed to hear today. Whatever you've done, wherever you've gone, however long you stayed away, 
the grace of God exceeds whatever you have done. There is nothing that you have done that is taking you outside the reach of the arms of God's grace. There is no journey that you went on that was too far, too long, to where God has said, I am done with you. Where sin increases, grace abounds all the more And a whole bunch of us needed to hear that and feel that and embrace the grace of God. Is that you? Is that you? Sadly, there is a way in which we can take that beautiful message and corrupt it. We can hear that beautiful message of grace and distort it. Which is what takes us into chapter 6 verse 1. Here it is. What shall we say then? All right, so what's our reaction to where sin increases, grace abounds? What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, we can logically get to that argument, can't we? Like, oh, how cool. If every time I sin, the blood of Jesus surpasses. If every time I sin, God's grace shows up in a bigger and bigger and grander way. If the blood of Jesus writes a blank check for my sins, might as well run up the tab, right? I mean, if God gets a kick out of forgiving people, I'm going to give him more opportunities to forgive me. That sounds a little silly. And yet, historically, we've seen people go there. Over and over and over again. It started first century. People back then, they called it Gnosticism. Said, well, we're spiritual and physical beings. What I do physically doesn't impact me spiritually. Ever heard anybody say, God knows my heart. So what I do doesn't matter. Or there's that, um, I'm saved and so I'm good. When the roll is called up yonder, God will straighten me out. And what I do between now and then really doesn't matter. I'm just going to live it up and wait till God takes me home. Or maybe you've heard the, all sins are equal. I'm not God. I mean, what do you expect? I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. What's the matter? Or maybe the most popular one recently. I don't need any negativity. Don't judge me. I'm good. Hmm. All of those are versions of, what should we say? Just keep sinning? I mean, I've been saved. What's the matter? If I'm forgiven, who cares? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. By no means. It's actually impossible for me to exaggerate the passion in that phrase. Impossible. It's like, Paul says, no way. Are are you kidding me? I'm about to lose my mind. God forbid. Are you freaking serious? I mean, think of those kind of phrases. This phrase is so passionate. It's not profane, but it's almost the impact of a screamed cuss word. I mean, it's just this, whoa, whoa. It was said in such a way that everybody first reading it would have flinched. And even more, Paul uses this phrase two times in this passage. And so everybody reading it was like, whoa! Like Paul is really passionate about what's going on. By no means, no way, are you kidding me? And then he explains why. Begins to. How can it be that we who died to sin still live in it? Dead. How how can it be that a person who is no longer the person they used to be, how is it that someone who has been totally separated from their old life, how can it be that someone who has been set free would go back to that bondage? No, no way to want to continue on the same trajectory just shows you don't understand how God has transformed your life through Jesus verse 4 takes it a little bit deeper take a look at it 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. This verse is so powerful. I shared this verse on our radio spots this week, the the radio spots we have where we get to share the gospel with our region. I shared Romans 6 verse 4. And here's the core of it. If Jesus was raised from the dead by God, we too can experience new life. If God raised Jesus from the dead, and I'm telling you what, there is really solid historical evidence, both in Scripture and even outside of Scripture, that Jesus was who he said he was, that Jesus did what he said he would do, that Jesus was raised from the dead. And if God did that in Jesus, you can experience a new life. New life. As different as life is from death. Because we were buried with him in baptism. So when you see somebody get baptized, you see the tip of the iceberg. So here are some images of the the people who have been baptized earlier this year. Just a few of them from earlier this year. When you see somebody get baptized, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg of everything that's going on. What's the everything include? That person has experienced conviction. You know that sense of, ooh, this path in life that I'm going down is taking me to really broken places. This person has experienced repentance. I'm going to turn from that direction and go a different direction. That person has confessed their trust in Jesus, that they are placing their faith. I believe in my heart, I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. In that, they have received the forgiveness of sins just as if they had never sinned. They've received the adoption as a child of God. They have a whole new life for eternity. Tip of the iceberg. When you see someone get baptized, you're seeing the tip of everything that God is doing in that person's life having been brought from death to life. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too can walk in the newness of life. So let's, let's walk through it. What's, what's baptism really mean? When you see someone get baptized, they start on this side. They're pre-Jesus, pre-conversion. They're back in the day story. As a kid, this involves selfishness. If you've ever had a child in your life, you know how selfish we are as kids. And it involves ignorance, like that time in your life before you could understand faith and what Jesus has done. And for many of us, that that season extended past our childhood years, and we saw lots of brokenness in our lives for years. This is your pre-story. We all have one. God has convicted me many times by how I've been blinded by someone I knew back in the day, their pre-story. So when you see someone get baptized, know that they have a this side of the journey. Also in our baptistry, we have steps, steps down into the baptistry And for those who have experienced new life in Jesus, the steps down, for many of us, were painful. Like we sense the conviction of our sins. We sense the idols that we had in our lives. All those things that we thought would bring us meaning and salvation and hope and fulfillment being crushed as those things disappointed us. This part of the journey is regularly not fun. This is the bad news of the good news. And then we get to the actual tank, the grave. Very similar to what happens when people we love die. We lay them to rest. 
This specifically reminds us of the grave of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and took on flesh, lived perfectly, died sacrificially. And when he breathed his last, it was confirmed multiple times that he was dead, dead, dead. And they put his body in the grave. And it was still a mess. It was gross. It was yucky. They had to get him off the cross quickly because the high and holy Sabbath was coming at sundown. And so they left his body there in the grave. We are buried with him in baptism. Just as Jesus died for our sins, with him, in him, we are dead to sin. A separation happens. We are no longer the person that was on that side of the baptistry. We are no longer owned by that death, that sin that has reigned in our lives. We're, we're dead. Which brings us to the really exciting part of the symbol and the story and the ordinance of baptism, which are these steps up. The ladies went to the tomb on Sunday morning knowing that his body had not been rightly prepared, knowing that he had been buried disrespectfully. And so they came with the spices. They came to clean up his body so they could rightly bury him. But the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. The stone had been rolled away. And there was clear, obvious, beautiful evidence that he was alive. And then people started encountering the resurrected Jesus We too can walk in the newness of life. We too can walk right up out of that grave and experience life in Jesus just as if we had been raised from death to life. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too can walk in the newness of life. So let's, let's be honest. Have you been praying to the God of transformation? Have you been praying to the God of resurrection? Or if we listen to your prayers, would we think you're praying to the God of coping mechanisms? So you're praying to the God of transformation or are you praying to a God of coping mechanisms? Where do you expect God to show up? Here's, here's what it's to look like when believers in Jesus hear the message of the gospel. You'll see it in verses 11 through 13. Number one, think rightly. You're dead to sin. You are alive to God. Think rightly. It is right that back in the day, you would say, the devil made me do it. I couldn't stop myself. It's actually an accurate statement. But in Christ, you are now dead to sin. Are you praying, are you expecting that God would bring transformation, that he would bring freedom, that you would be free from sin? Like, do you pray expecting that? Knowing that you're gonna be plagued by sins, but you are free from sin. Knowing that you're going to be seduced and you're going to get talked into it from time to time, but you are never under the power of sin. You are free. You're dead to it. Dead to it. So, don't give your life to it. Don't allow sin to have dominion over your life. It's not who you are. It's not what has power of you, over you. Don't go over there. And, and not only just don't go there, don't give any part of you to it. Not a part of you. Don't say, well, it's my only little vice. It's no big deal. It was just in the flesh. It was just, no, none of your members given to sin. No, no, no part of you. All of you given to God. All of you. Every aspect of you. God, take everything I have. Take my abilities, my strengths, my, my resources. God, take every passion that I have. I submit it to you. And so we see in verse 17 and 18, thank you, God. Thank you, oh God. Why? That you 
who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart. What happens when God gets a hold of you? He changes your heart. It's no longer about what can I get away with? It's no longer about me. It's no longer what can serve me, who can serve me. It's God. I want to be a part of what you're doing. Having been set free from sin, become slaves of righteousness. You were once a prisoner. The word slave has such a disgusting connotation. You were a slave. And then you were set free. And then there's this brand new type of slavery that is offered to us. We get to be slaves of righteousness. Surrendered to good Lord Jesus. I told Pastor Matt this week, Brother, I love to hear you pray, pray because you wrap up every prayer with in the good name of Jesus. What, what a beautiful reminder. When you experience life in Jesus, you discover more and more his ways are good. When God says no, he's not taking anything from you. He's protecting you from something. When God says do it, He's not imposing some sort of religion on you. He's directing you into life more abundantly. Slaves to Jesus. Our benevolent dictator where we have experienced life. God is inviting every one of us today either to be baptized or to remember our baptism. There are many, many people around us, many of us, who are not fully experiencing our freedom in Christ. And Jesus is inviting you to remember your baptism. You are dead to sin. You are brought to life. You are free from sin. Present your bodies to God. Remember your baptism. And then there are some of us who are recognizing today, huh, I've not been baptized, representing the tip of the iceberg. And God is inviting you to spontaneously be baptized. So what is baptism? Think starting line. Many people think, oh, okay, okay, I want to do that, but, but I need a little time to make things right. I need a little time to prove that I'm serious. I need a little time to understand. When the gospel was first preached after the resurrection of Jesus, 3,000 people got baptized. They didn't pause. They didn't wait till later. Being baptized is like the starting line, this new journey of faith you have in following Jesus. Secondly, just like a starting line, it's kind of a once in a lifetime. It represents Jesus' death, which was once and for all for our sins. And our death to sin and coming into alignment with Jesus. Generally, it's meant to be a once in a lifetime event. Now, several years ago, I had a lady come to me and say, Michael, I was raised in a Christian home. I was baptized as a believer in Jesus. And as a young adult, I completely literally renounced my faith. Would it be appropriate for me to be baptized again as a believer in Jesus? I said, yes. Yes. And sometimes, as we talk about baptism, you recognize that as the tip of the iceberg, it, re it represents all of this. It represents your coming to life. It is tied to your spiritual discovery. And some people later realize, oh, I didn't get baptized as a profession of my faith. It was this other thing. Somebody else decided it for me, or I had no idea what I was doing back then. But I have now come to faith and am ready to profess my faith in Jesus. Have you been baptized 
as a profession of your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ in your life? If you would say, no, I haven't. But I believe today is your day. To be baptized. Don't allow your clothes to stop you. We have a change for you. And again, does it really matter if you leave here dripping wet? Don't allow your friends or loved ones not being here today to stop you. We'll snag a video of it and send it with you. Don't allow your social anxiety to stop you. We are all for you. For you. We want God's best for you. We invite you today. So here's a, a, a snapshot, a collage of those who were baptized on Friday night. And I want to let you know that there are a few who have already decided to be baptized in this service. That was not true on Friday night. And six came forward to be baptized. That was not true at 9 a.m. when eight more came forward to be baptized. But we do have a few who have already decided that they were going to be baptized. Like they asked to be scheduled today. If, if that's you, would you go ahead and stand? We're going to celebrate with a few people. You've already decided. You've already said, hey, I'm going to be baptized today. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're invited to join them in professing faith in Jesus. We're going to get ready and start singing. And as we do, you're going to see some people over here gathered by that door. Remember, we got stuff ready for you just behind the wall to help you be ready to be baptized. So is God nudging you today to be baptized or is he nudging you to remember your baptism? You're also going to see some prayer team members over here And some of you would say, Michael, I don't have enough faith to pray for that transformation. We have some people who do. They have faith that God can bring that transformation. So remembering your baptism, this is your team. If you are ready to be baptized, this is your team over here. We want to serve you. We are for you as you discover today God's best for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me pray for us before we begin to worship. God, thank you for this special day. Thank you for a day when the lids are flipped back and the water is in the tank and you have provided a really special way for us to respond in faith. God, we celebrate those who have already been baptized and those who have already committed to be baptized today. We celebrate what they are declaring. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to respond in faith today. May you, by your spirit, direct and nudge. May you, as Jen prayed earlier, just remove those distractions, shatter any of those barriers that have been lies of the enemy whispering in our ear, um, misconceptions about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead us in this time as we discover a beautiful opportunity to respond in faith declaring that our hope is in Jesus. Lord, lead us in this time of worship, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our band stepping forward, will you please stand up as we begin to worship? Remember, if you're ready to be baptized, to your right. If you're ready to pray and remember your baptism over here, to your left. Let's worship together.